Perhaps no other issue has shaped post World War II Middle East like the Palestinian Israeli conflict has. The establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 and the subsequent expulsion of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians has caused an enmity that is still visible to the present day. The issue has been so central that all the prominent strains of ideological thought which dominated the region in the second half of the 20th century have addressed it, whether it was nationalism, pan-Arabism or Islamism. The conflict has led to numerous major wars and has repeatedly needed the world superpowers to step in and mediate. Through various twists and turns, Palestine and Israel have gone on to experience very different fates, with the dreams and aspirations of one moving further away from reality, whilst the other is moving towards its manifestation. World War II proved to be particularly important for the future of Palestine. Certain Zionist groups such as Ergun had initiated an insurgency against the British authorities. The bombing of the King David Hotel in 1946 being the most famous example. At the same time, the Arabs were still unhappy with the lack of prospects for self-governance. Feeling unable to deal with a problem it had created, in 1947, Britain stated its desire to terminate its mandate and passed the Palestine question to the newly created United Nations. In the immediate aftermath of World War II, the persecution faced by the Jews at the hands of the Nazis in Europe certainly won the Zionist cause a great deal of sympathy in the international arena. In late 1947, the United Nations announced its plan to partition Palestine into an Arab and Jewish state. The Arabs were absolutely furious, whilst the Zionists rejoiced for the most part. The very next day, a civil war erupted between the two sides that would see itself metamorphosize into a war between the newly established Israel and several Arab states who invaded in May 1948. By early 1949, Israel had emerged victorious against its numerous foes. The war is remembered in Israel as the War of Independence, whilst Palestinians remember the conflict as the Nakba, or the Catastrophe. Seen as a low point in Palestinian history, it is an appropriate name considering some 750,000 of them were forced to flee their homes. Israel gained a further 60% of the area proposed for an Arab state by the UN, and then went on to pass the law of return in 1950, which over the next few decades allowed over a million Jews around the world, especially Muslim countries, the right to gain Israeli citizenship. The territory not conquered by Israel was the West Bank and East Jerusalem, both of which were annexed by Jordan, whilst Egypt occupied the Gaza Strip. Crucially, Israel had only signed armistice agreements with the Arab states in 1949. With the absence of peace treaties, the prospect of war always loomed large. There would be three more major Arab-Israeli wars. The first of which, the 1956 Suez Crisis, saw Britain, France and Israel try to unsuccessfully gang up on Jamal Abdel Nasser's Egypt. In the 1950s and 60s, ideas of pan-Arabism became hugely popular, Nasser being seen as its charismatically defiant leader. And so, the cause of Palestine was left to its Arab brethren. The problem was, Oftentimes, the other Arab leaders were looking at it from the perspective of their own national interests. It was only in the aftermath of Israel's stunning victory in the Six Day War of 1967 that the Palestinians really tried to instrumentalize their own agency and take center stage on the political scene. Already in 1964, 
The PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, had been created as an umbrella organization with various activist militant groups, all united by the aim to liberate Palestine. Key nationalist militant groups, calling themselves Fedayeen, included Yasser Arafat-led Fatah and the PFLP, headed by George Habash. Initially, the insurgents attacked Israeli targets from within the occupied territories. Bearing in mind that the West Bank and the Gaza Strip had both been overtaken by the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, during the Six-Day War. But that quickly proved to be unfeasible, as the IDF sharply cracked down on their activity. Then the PLO moved their bases to neighboring Jordan, enjoying great success in raising the profile of the Palestinian armed struggle and attracting increased numbers of recruits. In the process, the Fedayeen brandished themselves as freedom fighters and tried to get the world to pay attention to the Palestinians' plight by carrying out brazen operations like hijacking civilian airplanes. In fact, the PLO became so powerful that it was likened to a state within a state in Jordan. To neutralize the threat to his sovereignty, in 1970, King Hussein of Jordan ordered the Jordanian forces to attack the PLO in an event known as Black September. The ultimate trigger for this was actually the Dawson's Field hijackings by the PFLP. The name Black September was then co-opted by a new Fedayeen group which decided to escalate the level of violence used. This is best exemplified by their attack at the 1972 Munich Olympics. By 1971, the PLO had been kicked out of Jordan and relocated to southern Lebanon, which they used as a base to strike Israel. Lebanon was a fractured country at that point, and the PLO asserted themselves as key players within its domestic politics. In 1975, a messy civil war erupted which the PLO was involved at the heart of. Three years later, Israel invaded southern Lebanon, having had enough of Fedayeen attacks on its soil. They would be forced to get involved in the country once again in 1982, when their second invasion of Lebanon forced the PLO out of the country. All the while this was happening, the enmity between Israel and its Arab neighbors had not subsided. In 1973, Syria and Egypt attacked Israel. Whilst it was certainly no victory for the Arabs, they did surprisingly well relative to their previous performances. But Nasser's successor, Anwar Sadat, was keen to normalize relations with his Jewish neighbor, to whom Egypt had lost control of the Sinai Peninsula during the course of the Six-Day War. In 1978, the two former foes came together at the Camp David Accords, mediated by American President Carter. The Egyptians agreed to recognize the state of Israel, and Israel agreed to withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula. Subsequently, President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin of Israel both won the Nobel Peace Prize. The Arab world, however, was shocked. Its leader, Egypt, was judged to have made a deal with the enemy and sold the Palestinians out consequently being kicked out of the Arab League. Sadat would pay for the Camp David Accords with his life, being assassinated in 1981 by an Egyptian Islamist. As for the Palestinians, their struggle had become well publicized, but yet they had little to show for it. By the beginning of the 1980s, they remained stateless much of them being scattered around the Arab world with refugee status. Israel, on the other hand, had gone from fighting for its survival to being in a relatively comfortable position against its foes. It's often the case that negotiations take place only once one side is overwhelmingly dominant. Having thus achieved the upper hand against its numerous Arab foes, in the space of 15 years between the late 70s and the mid 90s, Israel would go on to sign peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan, and even signed agreements with the PLO. In 
This transition was also reflected in its internal developments as well. As its external worries lessened, so too did the need for a state-controlled economy. From the 1970s onwards, Israel experienced a shift towards free market reforms that saw its economy become more liberalised. Thank you guys for watching. I want to thank my patrons for always supporting. If you want to financially support Hikmah History, there's a link to my Patreon in the description to this video. Until next time, peace.